the Enneagram and trauma. So as we have begun this semester of learning more about Van der Kolk's work and Siegel's work and Wallen's work, I have been very interested in learning more about how my passion for the Enneagram can be integrated into the trauma work that we will do as counselor educators and professionals within this field. What I would like to cover within this video is aspects are aspects of my paper, which are the topics listed here. The Enneagram, just giving you a basic overview of what this compassion tool, personality inventory, whatever ways in which people describe it, um, just the basics of what this looks like with, in regards to the, the conversation that we'll have within this video. The Enneagram and interpersonal neuroplasticity, along with polyvagal theory as it meets and integrates with the Enneagram. We're also going to talk about attachment in the centers of intelligence and then what it looks like to balance these centers of intelligence. Lastly, we will talk about the benefits of utilizing the Enneagram within trauma work. As we begin to understand a little bit more of the Enneagram, I wanted to share this video with all of you. However, the length um, is a little long, so we're going to watch the first part. The first part is a brief introduction to the Enneagram, and it's going to showcase why I find this to be such an integral part of trauma work and how I have been able to kind of have an overlay of the work that we have been talking about um, and aspects of the Enneagram. The second part of this video covers more um, involved aspects of each type, which is not the goal of this of this presentation. So I'm going to stop this um, after this just brief introduction. Enneagram, a liberating theory of personality. We start small and innocent in this world. Life was safe in the womb. But just the struggle to breathe when we make our appearance in this world is an indication that life is sometimes painful. No one likes pain. And it is human nature to protect ourselves. To cope with pain, it is as if we put on armor. Another term for that armor is personality. Problem is, sometimes we think our personality armor is who we truly are, and we lose sight of our true selves. The armor that once protected us often ends up keeping us from being who we truly are and causes all kinds of problems in relationships and life in general. Wouldn't it be nice to be able to identify what is our personality armor and what is our true selves? There is a way. It's called the Enneagram. While modern personality tests are intended to identify pathology and create labels for diagnosing, the Enneagram is a system of studying personality armor patterns that actually provides an awareness of the pattern which then allows for a release of that personality pattern. The Enneagram is an ancient system of personality theory and study. Its roots can be traced back about 4,000 years. The numbers positioned in the diagram are a modern addition. Each number on the wheel represents a different personality armor pattern of responding to life's surprises. Some theorists have assigned names as well, but numbers have been found to reduce potential negative connotations that names can add. By way of a snapshot of each number, here is a pictorial representation of the different personality. Okay, and that is where I wanted to stop because it's gonna go into a description of each of the types. But now you have a brief understanding of the Enneagram as we move on to um, other topics within this paper. So in addition to this video, I just wanted to cover these two aspects of the Enneagram that I find to be very important when talking about trauma work. So the Enneagram is a self-compassion tool as well as a self-liberation tool. 
So as we think about the work around trauma, this idea of self-compassion is so important as clients start to unravel their trauma stories. It's important to have some sort of tool to allow clients to love themselves through the process. And I believe that the Enneagram is an excellent resource to provide some self-compassion around their true identity as we look at their core motivations and their core fears and many of these items we will talk about in the next few slides. This self-liberation tool is also an aspect of the Enneagram that I believe is truly at the heart of trauma work. It, it allows us to liberate ourselves from these fixations of identity and allows the ego to fall away so that we can access our transcendent self, also known as our essence or our true self, which is the goal within trauma work, is how do we get clients back in integration of their ex past experience to their current experience to, to access their transcendent self. So moving on to the topic of the Enneagram and interpersonal neuroplasticity. As we began reading Mindsight and learning about Dan Siegel's research and his work around interpersonal neuroplasticity, I found it so intriguing and so interesting um, at times rereading some of his work, just really trying to understand completely um, what it is within trauma work that we are we as clinicians are giving space for our clients to work through and experience. In, in one video I watched of Dan Siegel, he talked about the importance of recognizing when a client walks into our office that they are a body first, that they, that they come in with a body, which I know sounds silly, but recognizing that they are walking into our office with a body. Um, they're also walking into our offices with um, an inherited experience from generational trauma, generational past, generational experiences long before they were even created in the womb. In addition, they're coming in with a social aspect of themselves, a social being because they're human and they have connections and interactions with other people. So their own personal experience from childhood until that very moment. In addition, there is a story. There are stories that people arrive in our offices with, the stories that they tell themselves, the stories that they may even make up and believe. And so this idea of this integration of all aspects of a human being that sits in front of us is so so very important and this is the part that I have have truly been much more mindful of when meeting with clients and I just want to talk a little bit about how the Enneagram shows up in Dan Siegel's work around interpersonal neuroplasticity so a scholar within the world of the Enneagram um, his name is David Daniels he actually passed away a few years ago, but he did some research around these, this very topic that Wallen speaks about um, when we think about the reflective stance. So along with, along with Siegel's work, David Daniels actually, um, David Daniels and Dan Siegel worked together and collaborated together which was an exciting part of my research for my paper. I was having a, um, I don't know what kind of moment you want to call it, maybe a doctoral student nerd moment where two of two people within the research of two of my passions, counseling and the Enneagram, I didn't realize that they had done some work together. So um, this is actually the work of David Daniels from the Enneagram where he came up with the five A's. In, in allowing allowing people to to work through this process of going from reactive to reflective. And this is also the work of Wallen. This is also around the work of Siegel in the the reflective stance that we want we want clients to be able to get to. So David Daniels mentions these five A's, which are awareness, acceptance, appreciation, action, and adherence. And the first two are the ones that I wanted to just highlight 
um, and that those are the two I highlighted within my paper, is this idea of awareness and this idea of acceptance, which is the which are key to moving from reactivity to reflectiveness. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in the next couple slides. So these were two quotes from Wallen that I found to be particularly important when I'm considering how the Enneagram can be helpful in trauma work. With a reflective stance, we can step back from the immediate reality of our experience and respond in light of the mental states that might underlie it or mentalize. In addition, Wallen said that with great freedom to mentalize, we are less likely to be in inescapably gripped by emotional reflexes laid before us in the courses of our first relationships. To, to give a better understanding of what this reflective stance looks like through the lens of the Enneagram, I wanted to share my own personal experience with each of you and why I have such a passion of wanting to integrate this into my work as a counselor, as a counselor educator, and preferably within the work that I will do with clients around trauma. So I wanted to just take some time to talk about this whole idea of reflective stance, both from the perspective of Wallen, but also from my own perspective as somebody. So I wanted to just take some time to talk about this whole idea of reflective stance, both from the perspective of Wallen, but also from my own perspective as somebody who has worked through the Enneagram and has used it as a tool of transformation. The Enneagram has actually allowed me to access some of my core motivations and core fears. One of the core fears of the Enneagram 3, which is my type, is a fear of being worthless. Might sound a little intense, but most of my motivation is around being successful and driven. There is a lot of focus on image and drive and always wanting to make something better and always wanting to achieve more. In addition, Enneagram 3s fall into a triad of competency. They really, really desire to be competent in their beliefs, in their goals, in some of their own self-awareness. And when others challenge them, there's a reactivity that presents itself. In addition, Enneagram 3s don't always have access directly to the feelings they are experiencing in the moment. With such a driven and goal-oriented focus, Enneagram 3s will displace their feelings to the side because they tend to get in the, in the way of their tasks, it gets in the way of their goal setting, and it gets in the way of getting things accomplished. So through my own work with this self-transformation tool, I have begun over the last few years in taking on a reflective stance, as Wallen describes it, or an internal observer. Finding myself pulling away from my subjective experience and not being embedded in it, I have been able to look at my experience from an objective lens and recognize when I'm displacing my feelings when they need to stay in the here and now and need to be processed. When I have been so focused on competency that I lose touch with the relational aspects and other people's perception that could help me in decision making, in also goal setting, and also where I get kind of lost in the subjective experience. So when Wallen talks about these inescapable grips of emotional reflexes, I learn through the use of the Enneagram what mine are to me. And I have helped students recognize these inescapable grips of their own emotional reactivity and their own emotional reflexes that they weren't able to access before knowing and understanding the Enneagram. This first step of self-awareness offers students the ability to not only become an internal observer, but also take steps into transformation and figuring out how to respond and be responsive in this reflective stance instead of constantly reactive. So as we have been reading about Wallen's work 
in Van der Kolk's work and Siegel's work. It has left me very interested in how the Enneagram can help clients and students that I work with in processing their trauma. I find that many students who sit before me are definitely embedded in the subjective experience and with the use of the Enneagram, at least my own experience and those who I have witnessed around me have been able to take themselves from this subjective embedded stance into a mentalizing, into an integration of their experiences, allowing themselves to become internal observers of what is really happening for them personally through their trauma and through their reflective um, impulses and instincts and finding themselves in a place where they can begin to have a self-transformation, a place where they can integrate their trauma experience into their here and now and also be more mindful of what is happening in the present moment. So it's so I wanted to just take some time to talk about this whole idea of reflective stance, both from the perspective of Wallen, but also from my own perspective as somebody who has worked through the Enneagram and has used it as a tool of transformation. The Enneagram has actually allowed me to access some of my core motivations and core fears. One of the core fears of the Enneagram 3, which is my type. Next, I want to talk about polyvagal theory and how I think that it lines up and meets the Enneagram exactly where it is. So this, the polyvagal theory of, um, of the familiar, of our brain um, being kind of stuck in fight, flight, or freeze, I have found some of these quotes to resonate both with polyvagal theory, of course, but also they align very, very well with the Enneagram. So the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, but expecting different results, of course, is crossed, crossed out in this quote that I have here. And the one that is left is our minds seek the familiar. Repeating the same, be same behaviors is called a pattern which comes from childhood conditioning. We repeat what we know. And so I thought this was a good description of polyvagal theory in a very, um, just be able to picture it and understand it well. That our brains definitely um, pick up on these same behaviors and patterns and we often just repeat what we know. It's not always um, that we even make the conscious choice or de decision, but our brain doesn't have the ability to say, oh, this isn't the same thing that you experienced. It just knows that it's a similar experience and this is how we're going to respond and this is how we're going to behave. I also like this picture here about trauma responses and how what they can look like and how they can show up. Um, feeling responsible for others' happiness, saying yes because you're scared of losing security, chronic feelings of emptiness. I'm not going to read all of them. Um, but here are just the faces of trauma and, and what it looks like. And, I, and, and this picture was one that I often um, look towards when working with people with trauma in the, in the masks um, that they may wear, but also when they bring their integrated self into the counseling center and into your counseling offices is they may only be able to provide a short narrative that might be around one of these topics and so how do we um, take that narrative and then integrate it within their body and integrate it in with their narrative integrate it within their somatic experiences and this last quote at the top talks about Trauma compromises our ability to engage with others by replacing patterns of connection with patterns of protection. And so I think this is a good understanding. Of course, this is from um, Stephen Porges. I think that's how you say his last name. And, and this is a good representation of, as counselors, we need to be very aware of the protection, the patterns of protection that come into play, that our brains have resorted to as the behavior when trauma surfaces, when there is some sort of fear, when there is something that is causing us to respond in a fight, flight, or freeze moment.
So the work that we do in counseling and especially within trauma work is, you know, being able to go from the dorsal vagal, which is the freeze, the freeze component of where the body kind of collapses and is, in, and is immobile. And often where, where people within trauma will experience some shame, um, some hopelessness, and, and there will be kind of a, an entrapment or shutdown mode, um, feeling very overwhelmed into the sympathetic nervous system, which often responds with um, a fight or flight. So either moving away or moving towards. And this also brings up um, a lot of emotions around, which we see often with our, with our clients, of panic and fear and anxiety and irritation and frustration. And there is a little less overwhelmed emotion um, compared to the freeze but there is still not this social engagement of the ventral vagal um, nervous system which allows for our clients to respond with more openness and curiosity and compassion and mindfulness and this is where I feel like the Enneagram is really helpful from allowing our clients to maybe transition from the dorsal vagal or the sympathetic nervous system into the ventral vagal because there is this self-compassion tool to the Enneagram and there is a groundedness in understanding ourself in a way that is compassionate versus there is something wrong with me. Next, I want to talk about attachment and centers of intelligence. So within the Enneagram, there is a triad of, of intelligences, and there are three. And this was actually covered in um, my lecture in Dr. Nasita's class, so many of you are going to recall this. But um, it, it looks similar to what I showed in my presentation um, last week with Dr. Nasita. So this is a picture of the Enneagram and what is shown here is the, the Enneagram as a whole. So these nine beautiful types that we um, come into the world, also known as kind of the nine sparks of divinity, that, that the gifts that we have been given. And there are three centers of intelligence. So there is the doing center and there is the feeling center and there's the thinking. So this triad of numbers it tends to filter their world through their body. Um, they have a gut intelligence. And we think of attachment, these are the numbers that truly want to be protected and respected. Even as small children, they kind of show up in the world hoping that they are protected and hoping that they're respected. And oftentimes if that's not shown or given to them, they will often go out into the world and make sure that people are protected and respected. And I don't wanna get into all that, but, but that's their goal. The feeling triad of the twos, threes, and fours is, is a feeling um, where feelings are a big part of their world. They tend to filter the world through emotional intelligence. They can sense the emotions um, of other people. They tend to want to connect and be loved, and they show up in their childhood with that desire. And when it's not met, they go and out into the world and, and seek after it aggressively sometimes and then the thinking triad is the five six and sevens and this center of intelligence tends to filter the world through their mental facilities they are very much looking for um, the practical and the objective and they're the problem solvers of our world and they also really want to be acknowledged and seen and this shows up in childhood as well the work of David Daniels and Siegel actually um, came to be that they, they saw that if these centers of intelligence were balanced, that a more secure attachment could be found. And many people would wonder how you would go about balancing these, which I'm going to talk about in the next slide. So the work of the Enneagram recognizes that we as humans have access to all of these centers of intelligence. But what we learned from an early age is that our holding environment gave the capacity to only hold one of those. And so we lead pretty strongly with 
one of these centers of intelligence that it becomes kind of our dominant kind of walk through life with this dominant intelligence and have access to the others we have access to the other intelligence but but it's not an automatic so it needs to be practiced and when there is a balancing so if we think of like a three-legged stool if if there is balance to all three of that these there can be a transformation there could be a, a personal transformation into a more secure attachment there is also great wisdom in being able to balance all three of these. So when we're thinking of balancing these, this is the idea that we become these internal observers and we can detach ourselves slightly from our dominant center. So for myself, I'm in the feeling center. And so I can, as my um, short story shared, I can be very embedded in the subjective experience all the time. And so the goal for me is to recognize when I am embedded and how I need to, I need to pull myself out and put on my head center of intelligence. So what am I actually thinking? Because I know what's happening feeling wise with myself, with other people constantly but what does it look like to think through? What does the headspace say? And then oftentimes pulling up my body center to stop and, and allow the feelings and the thinking to be level with the body. What is my body experiencing? What is it that my somatic experience has to say about this current experience I'm having in the here and now? So as I talk about this, what it, what it is, is it's this reflective stance. How can we be reflective in helping our clients be reflective in, if this is your dominant center of intelligence, maybe we need to, maybe we need to bring up your head center of intelligence. Maybe we need to bring up your body center of intelligence and ask ourselves questions around those centers of intelligence. What am I thinking? What some metacognition? Why do I think this? Why am I? What? How do I? Why do I think the way I think? Or what is my stomach saying? Or what is my chest saying? Or where do I feel pain in my body? I felt that this was a beautiful description of what it would look like to have an integration of these centers of intelligence that would also benefit and help in trauma work because there's this beautiful picture of how things would flow, how you could flow from one center of intelligence into the other whenever necessary and whenever needed. And lastly, I just wanted to cover the benefits of utilizing the Enneagram within trauma work. These are the three that I have begun to unpack myself as I've begun this research, and there may be more, and these also might change as I come to understand how the Enneagram can be beneficial within the trauma work that we do. The one is accessing core fears. I feel like oftentimes it takes a little longer to access those core fears, even as we think about the story that, um, Siegel shared with Stuart. It took a little while for him to access the core fear, fears of Stuart. And oftentimes with the Enneagram, I'm able to access my client's core fears fairly quickly. And that offers me insight into this emotional react, reactive impulses because oftentimes these impulses are built around these fears. Furthermore, I believe that this also creates a reflective stance. I think the Enneagram kind of parallels the process that many of these authors are talking about in regards to a reflective stance. The Enneagram actually provides kind of a space to create that, the space between stimuli and response that Viktor Frankl talks about, um, that we can give space to our past experience or our experience now, and then how do we respond instead of react? Lastly, I really believe that the Enneagram provides a concrete aspect of doing trauma work, that there is tangible ways to engage in integration 
of traumatic experience. Oftentimes when we are talking about the work of Wallen and the work of Siegel and the work of Vanderkolk, I struggle with some of the abstract thinking behind these, these great teachers and these great researchers. So oftentimes trying to implement that into my practice and help clients understand um, these aspects of trauma work can feel a tad overwhelming. And so with the Enneagram, I have found that there are tangible ways through the Enneagram system that allow clients to visually see some of their own core motivations, core fears, core desires, their centered intelligence. Um, I didn't speak about this in here, but their instincts, when we think of the reptilian brain, there are instincts um, within this work, the Enneagram work, that allow them to recognize that some of their instincts are based on their trauma. They're also a part of protection. And also orientation to time, which we didn't discuss in this, but there are many aspects of the Enneagram that I feel like are, are tangible and visible that I believe would be helpful in working with clients um, as working through trauma and many of the things that I've shared in my paper can oftentimes be very uh, abstract and difficult for clients to grasp. So this is the end of my presentation. I hope that all of you have enjoyed it and I'm sure we will process and there'll be questions, but I am super excited to continue to research and learn different ways to collide my passion of the Enneagram into the work that I will do as a counselor educator around trauma is a fear of being worthless might sound a little intense but most of my motivation is around being successful and driven there is a lot of focus on image and drive and always wanting to make something better and always wanting to achieve more in addition enneagram threes fall into a triad of competency they really, really desire to be competent in their beliefs, in their goals, in some of their own self-awareness. And when others challenge them, there's a reactivity that presents itself. In addition, Enneagram 3s don't always have access directly to the feelings they are experiencing in the moment. With such a driven and goal-oriented focus, Enneagram threes will displace their feelings to the side because they tend to get in the, in the way of their tasks. It gets in the way of their goal setting and it gets in the way of getting things accomplished. So through my own work with this self-transformation tool, I have begun over the last few years in taking on a reflective stance as Wallen describes it, or an internal observer. Finding myself pulling away from my subjective experience and not being embedded in it, I have been able to look at my experience from an objective lens and recognize when I'm displacing my feelings when they need to stay in the here and now and need to be processed. When I have been so focused on competency that I lose touch with the relational aspects and other people's perception that could help me in decision-making in also goal setting and also where I get kind of lost in the subjective experience. So when Wallen talks about these inescapable grips of emotional reflexes, I learn through the use of the Enneagram what mine are to me. And I have helped students recognize these inescapable grips of their own emotional reactivity and their own emotional reflexes that they weren't able to access before knowing and understanding the Enneagram. This first step of self-awareness offers students the ability to not only become an internal observer, but also take steps into transformation and figuring out how to respond and be responsive in this reflective stance instead of constantly reactive. So as we have been reading about Wallen's work and Vander Kolk's work and Siegel's work, it has left me very interested in how the Enneagram can help clients and students that I work with 
in processing their trauma. I find that many students who sit before me are definitely embedded in the subjective experience and with the use of the Enneagram, at least my own experience and those who I have witnessed around me have been able to take themselves from this subjective embedded stance into a mentalizing, into an integration of their experiences, allowing themselves to become internal observers of what is really happening for them personally through their trauma and through their reflective um, impulses and instincts and finding themselves in a place where they can begin to have a self-transformation, a place where they can integrate their trauma experience into their here and now and also be more mindful of what is happening in the present moment. So it's super exciting to find ways in which the Enneagram can help students, help clients with this process of trauma and helping them heal from their own life experiences. So that was just a, a little um, a brief picture snapshot of my experience and how the Enneagram has helped me in my own, in my own trauma um, of my own narrative and has allowed me to begin some self transformation and has allowed me to not be as embedded in the subjective experience that we've talked about.